I'm Dave Cope. I'm the director of the Women in the Arts um, thing. This is the last time you're going to see me for two and a half weeks. I'll probably be hosting the student women's reading when we finish this thing off at the end. But by and large, we want to have this be a woman's celebration, not a man's. And the reason I'm up here now basically is because Diane's a friend and because I've got some thanks to give for all the people that contributed to this. So bear with me as we start. I need to start with our thanks. First of all, with the, uh, for the people that have either funded this thing or uh, the Women in the Arts Celebration, or for those people who have, um, in one way or another, contributed to making it possible. There were a lot of people that wrote letters of support when we asked for them. And um, I want to make sure they all get their credit, and I'm sure I'll forget somebody. So for starters, President Olivares and the Board of Trustees who helped fund this thing, along with the Arts Council of Grand Rapids, who generously gave us their mini-grant, which made the entire thing possible. It's a great learning experience for me to work with Judith Larson, who's one of the finest motors you ever saw in your life as far as getting work done. Uh, the Michigan Trails Girl Scouts Council supported us. Uh, Fred Sabalski and Actors Theater. Um, and of course, their production of Elizabeth Rex with Stephanie Sandberg from Calvin College as director will be coming up for shortly. Um, tickets are still available. Don't miss it. Um, a great show. Um, Grand Rapids Art Museum, uh, the Community Media Center, um, a actress and playwright Jean Reed Bailey. Um, some of you may have seen some of her work. She had a fabulous production, All Male Romeo and Juliet, last, last winter, which was just wonderful. And then all the performers that are going to perform in this thing. My special thanks, uh, people that have worked with me, around me, um, told me what to do sometimes uh, and worked to get this thing to happen. Assistant Provost Patty Trepkowski has been an absolute rock in this thing. We could not have done any of it without her. Judith Larson, Grand Rapids Community College grants person, who is a kind of the kind of person who can work 14 hours straight. I'm not accustomed to working with someone that can work harder and faster than me, and she was one. Uh, Grand Rapids Women's, uh, Women's Community College Women's Studies Initiative. This is about 20 to 25 people, given the different times when we've met, who are all trying to develop the Women's Studies program. The Feminist Reading Group, um, I'm not going to name them individually here, but they are people that have worked harder than anyone else to make this happen. Not only this conference, but the development of courses that will eventually become our Women's Studies program. Uh, Chris Arnold in the Diversity Office, they have several offerings that are a part of what we're doing. Uh, the Grand Rapids Community College librarians who have provided venues, who have opened do doors for us and done all sorts of other things that uh, they continue to amaze me. Um, my colleague Sharon Weinkoop, uh, the visionary who was, has been behind this thing for the last 20 years. So, uh, Kathleen Russell, who went around roust rousting up grants. Um, Catherine Marty, my student, who um, made all sorts of suggestions to, uh, for performers and connections with other people. And then my two daughters, Anne and, uh, Anne and uh, Jane Cope. Uh, Anne was the one who drove the poster. Jane made all sorts of suggestions for books for the library and also for the films for the film series. So those are our background people as far as that goes. None of this would happen without them. Um, on to Diane. Um, I've worked with Diane twice before and uh, at, at different functions. And what I've always been really impressed with is the, the nervous energy that she brings to her readings and to her relationships with people, the um, ferocity of her spirit, uh, the fact that she will not back away from things where sometimes people s sort of talk sideways rather than come at you straight. She's always right up front with you, always. Um, I have a few quotes from some of her poems that may give you some ideas of what we get when we get a Diane Wachowski reading. She is the, the sword with the starry hilt. A blue vein of electricity came to her in Magellanic clouds. Her wrists always have salmon leaping for spring in them. Mourning her lost brother, she is flying to unlock the sun, to let out the heat, unlock the moon, and resting on a branch, saying, key, key. Don't pity her. She is proud, 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 and honest, honest like a dormant volcano you've trusted too long. 
She's the woman who asks why you stayed married to a man who beat you when the chicken wasn't cooked thoroughly. She's the one who dances on the grave of a son of a bitch. And she will dance, dance, dance on your grave, grave, grave. She'll make her own pl perfect blanket stitch, rebelling, rebelling against a plain apron. And she will rest drinking tea from a white bone china cup, asking, do women dream the Saturnian ice of emeralds and sapphires because men never touch them? Please welcome Diane McCoskey. frightening to hear one's words coming out of someone else's mouth. <laughs> I thought I'd begin tonight <clears throat> with a goddess poem. Um, I asked David what he thought I should address tonight, and he said, of course, women's empowerment. And um, so my theme tonight is women uh, as goddesses. This poem uh, was written um, very recently for a friend of mine, a woman who is a medical anthropologist. She's the best gardener we know, and she spent her life studying plants that heal people. Um, she came to dinner at our house uh, last summer, and that in event inspired Snowy Owl Goddess. Ludell in a loose cotton dress the color of delphiniums her hair owl feathered and quiet as her naked toes in their pale sandals is a friend from this harvest part of our lives a minerva woman of herbs and salsas hellebore trumpet vines and heirloom tomatoes she glides among us all carefully as if we too might be live plants Usually fastidious, <clears throat> almost in a trance from the head, heady August evening, and perhaps from the corner of my indolent eye, more absorbing the murmur than watching, I registered this snowy owl of a woman as she stripped an owl, as she stripped an olive through her raptor's mouth, then delicately flung the pit into the narrow garden verge next to her deck chair. Usually fastidious as a pharmacist weighing cr crystals, she surprised me in this seeming act of littering until I realized, oh, the pit might take root, grow. It was her planter's instinct, give every seed a place. Sipping her Chardonnay and with one hand cracking some pistachios to neatly deposit their shells in a bowl, with pits from olives the rest of us had eaten, she reminds me that even with su abundance, there need not be waste. Every day the image, planted in the hull of twilight conversation, visits me. Its arcing motion, her arm unfolding into air, with the olive pit bowing earthward, Minerva transformed into Diana, of the hunt and chase, a snowy owl suddenly spreading her ten-foot wingspan to cover this sacred earth. Well, I'm, I'm honored that David invited me tonight to speak to this uh, women's event. Um, I suppose my qualification is that I was a very insistent female voice of the 60s, um, one who, as David said, uh, would say anything and did say anything to proclaim my sense of empowerment or entitlement. Um, tonight my reading, as I said, is um, somewhat organized around the idea of women as goddesses. But it's also working with the theme that I've used to put together a memoir, four-volume collection of poems that's still not quite finished, called Noir, as in film noir. Um, I I'm thinking about the fact that, for me, one of the definitions of being a woman is having that dark side, the dark side of the moon that's secret, 
occult, uh, the part that's hidden that people don't know and therefore is a secret and important part of what one, one's power is. Uh, in, in working uh, with my poems as, a, as books over the last decade or so, I've been also working with text from books for laymen about uh, quantum physics. And the most recent book that I've been using to fuel some of my poems is a book called The Universe at Midnight by Ken Croswell. Um, and uh, many things intrigue me about this book uh, of cosmology. But one of them is its explanation of why we have night, which seems interesting to me. But I thought I would read to you this tiny um, quotation from the text, which is not about night, but about something that I associate with women. Ken Croswell says, even weirder than quarks or dark matter is dark energy. There is twice as much dark energy as dark matter. It has repulsive gravity, and it is causing the universal expansion to speed up. Its presence was discovered recently by competing teams, one led by a physicist and the other by an astronomer. Both were trying to measure a slowing down in the expansion of the universe. Instead, they found it is accelerating. Dark energy has been called the deepest mystery in all of physics and astronomy. It could simply be the quantum energy of nothingness, something almost mundane to physicists, or something truly exotic. The influence of the additional spatial dimensions predicted by string theory. It will tell us the destiny of the universe. Well, I've always associated with the moon because my name is Diane and of course the moon is also in all mythology associated with female energy and I'm sure that one of the reasons for not that is is not just the old traditional and kind of sad reason which is that the moon is reflected light from the sun uh, the female reflecting the male but the fact that we never see one side of the moon there is a dark side of the moon that's never been seen and um, I like that. <laughs> it makes me feel good. Um, I'm going to read a poem now <clears throat> that uses imagery from the tarot deck called Three of Swords. In the tarot deck that I have used for years, the Three of Swords is a card represented by a valentine heart on a gray background with three swords stabbing through the heart. Actually, it doesn't have anything to do with heartbreak, but it's such a nice image. Three of Swords for Dark Men Under the White Moon. Yes, of old wire hangers that remain in the closet. Of the Satsuma Suma plum tree you crawled out of the window to in the dark after they thought <clears throat> their ten-year-old child was asleep but was resting in the branches like a cat who knows where to sit herself silkily down, resting, surrounded by leaves, rustling like many hands dealing cards swiftly. Yes, of the moon in her wet menstrual period, lacing rust streaks across a crater. Yes, of asters that grow in the backyard, some under your bed. What we never speak of is that I love too many men and would not be unfaithful to myself. I am the sword with the starry hilt. Dream of me. I love you in a rain of gray paint as I love the coyote for his stealing and the lonely westerner for his silver bullets and all George Washington's first and last and the men who hold out that wild card, the three of swords not knowing my heart melts and bleeds and runs for their steel. It sings for piercing, and it accepts hungrily the knife. It comes for its exercise in a bed made of swords and asks genuinely to be rebathed in thick plasma each night. 
How can I tell you the moon was made to shine alone each night, walking to her bath and undressing alone? Her breasts spout milk and her children slide down from the sky. Her lovers she nibbles and whispers to, sends messages by the wind to touch their ears, takes, allows herself to be taken calmly each day away. Oh, how can I tell you she loves you but wants to be alone, wants to be in your wrist, a pulse, but not in your house? See, she is outside the window now. You look at her. It does not mean you should try to bring her inside. I believe all truth is paradox. Just as there is no wholeness or presence without absence or what is missing. There is light that can only be perceived by darkness. For instance, you can't see the stars in the daytime. You need night's darkness to see them. Actually, one of the things that Croswell talks about in his book is um, the Big Bang theory of the expanding universe and that one of the reasons that we have night is that the light from the stars is so far away it can't reach us. And uh, I was meditating on, on that. Uh, this next poem is called The Shores of the Milky Way. Um, that's another one of his phrases, The Shores of the Milky Way. Um, and in this chapter on darkness and night, he pointed out that our 19th century American poet Edgar Allan Poe actually already had had this concept before our quantum physics today have it, uh, now based on mathematics. But Poe was just simply thinking metaphysics, and he ingeniously proposed that light from distant stars failed to brighten the night sky because the light had not had time to reach us. We can't see farther than the universe is old. I doubt if any of you have seen a film uh, by French filmmaker Jacques Demy called The Bay of Angels uh, because it's not available on DVD um, and obviously there aren't very many places where you'd see it, although recently a new version of the film, as a new, technically new version of the film has been put out. But um, it's a film that captured my imagination, I think even before I became a gambler. It's about a woman, a middle class woman who goes to Monte Carlo and suddenly decides she wants to spend her life, just abandon her life and become a gambler. And she meets a banker there who decides the same thing. And this poem is, is an attempt to think about my life, my early love life uh, when I was a student at Berkeley and before, and how this helped shape me in this expanding universe. The Shores of the Milky Way. Crushed on the edge of San Francisco Bay, I hadn't yet seen Jacques Demy's Bay of Angels, nor developed my passion for gambling. The only risks I took were with my life. Unlike Demy's housewife gambler, I had no husband to leave behind. One man taught me to eat bagels, cream cheese, and lox on a Sunday morning after sex. Another romanced me at the laundromat, the one I loved, read Garcia Lorca to Soigne professor's daughters living in the Berkeley Hills. And a Dutchman, all angles, noirish cheekbones and smoking Gaulois blue, brought out the old snob in me as we talked naked in bed. And he revealed he was flunking out of university. I've forgotten his name and only remember the Dutchman's cheeks, smooth as ice cream that night, and longing I could have fulfilled by returning to his bed. So many lovers for this girl with long black stockings and Alice in Wonderland hair. 
I had a mystery face that held secrets, like tapestries damasked and textured over perfect skin. When I first watched Demi's film long past those Berkeley days, it mesmerized me. In it, the blonde woman followed her only obsession, followed only her obsession as I had followed mine. The risks I took then were with my life, yet gambling scarcely interested me at all. The pull I knew was sex. It drew me, made me want to spend every moment, moment pursuing it, the way I feel now about slot machines, blackjack, poker, and craps. I thought of myself then as a knight, questing for love, the pure love Percival felt for the grail. And yet no sex ever really satisfied me, left me always wanting meaning, waiting for more. I might see the grail hovering, shimmering over each man tattooed or leathered or wearing motorcycle boots, but never could I hold the cup in my hand or drink from it, just as Never once have I gambled and been ready to lay down the cards and leave a casino or any lover. In Bay of Angels, both bank teller and housewife know that gambling is about hope. The grail, the cup, always being held out, floating in trance or dream, never grasped, usually hidden. The concept of ever-expanding universe our cosmologists have really uh, re recently authenticated explains why the sky is dark at night. We can never reach the edge of it, but we rest on the banks of the Milky Way, infinitesimally small, with a testimony. You can lead your daily life, your connection to others, your job if you are a bank teller, or your husband, if you are a wife. You toss and toss the dice for lighted nights, and each loss makes you hope the more that you might win. But winning is like orgasm, satiating you, satiating you briefly. There is no happily ever after. Because once you win, you feel you could illuminate everything. There would be no dark, no night sky to regularly contrast with day. Because there was no night, you'd win and win and forever win, fearing the risk of never again to experience the truth, the rush, or more important, to feel hope. Living as if your own Bay of Angels could illuminate everything, even sex, games of chance, the missing cup a wandering saint's lips once touched, Illuminate this question. Why is the sky dark at night? And I, not any longer the girl with the wandering poetry hair who wore stockings of noir in her beatnik cafe. See, if the universe is really expanding, we should never age. Oh, that's fast. Mm -hmm. Um, you probably know that the term film noir was coined by the new wave French uh, filmmakers, Godard, others. Um, and what they wanted to do was interesting. They fell in love with the black and white gangster, mostly gangster movies, grade B movies of the 40s and 50s uh, made in Hollywood. And they loved that contrasty black and white um, and just a little side bar here. If you haven't seen Good Night and Good Luck, um, there's there are a lot of reasons to see it, but one of them is the cinematography. It's in black and white, and boy, do you see the the black and white of film noir uh, in the most beautiful way in that film. At any rate, um, I, uh, you know, my generation is a generation that's always believed that the world isn't black and white, that it's all, all the shades in between. And yet I think that something that still remains metaphorically powerful for me is, is that everything really is black and white. Um, and if you don't understand those contrasts, you really don't understand 
other aspects uh, of uh, reality. I suppose it's part of my destiny that um, several of the important men in my life were photographers. My high school boyfriend, um, the man with whom I began the secret story of my life, was the school photographer. Um, his dark room was his, in his father's avocado orchard in Southern California where we lived, and where we had many illicit moments. Um, my first legal husband was a photographer. He's the man who took the picture of me pointing the gun at the world. And the man I've been married to for um, several decades now, my current and wonderful husband, Steel Man, is a photographer who only works in black and white and certainly not in digital. <laughs> and um, so I wanted to write a poem in which I used the trope of photography uh, to somehow think about my own history. And this poem is called Winter Sol Solstice. Winter Solstice, as you know, is the shortest day of the year. So it's the day when we have the least light and the most dark. And it's at the center of both pagan and religious ceremonies for the Christian world, Christmas, where we celebrate um, the day that marks the time when ever after for the next six months, each day will become longer and have more light. Winter solstice. You photographed me pointing the revolver at your camera, that early 60s black and white you took of me wearing your rawhide jacket and nothing else. My long white neck vulnerable as snow in the city, its pristine surface quickly turned ragged and stark as North Dakota in the flash bulb night. And my anger, black as the prop gun I held, is still there, fuming about all your infidelities, but especially ro your romance with the nice Brit on the France, when we sailed the Atlantic to a Carnaby Street London of wide neckties, vivid colors over there in swinging England, even in the Japanese film I saw alone, filled with images of rice that was not white, but infused with ivory. In New York, the city where we married, you flaunted the harsh angles of Hollywood's French discover genre, the contrast of shadows that contained no gray, the white moments of witty sex that flared into lies and warehouses of betrayal. Film noir loved blondes, for their hair would bleach in the high contrast shots into the banner of deception. I loved the sun in those days. It turned my blonde skin dark and my dishwater hair to streaked white gold, just like those beautiful bad girls. When you knew me, I had no art. I was not black and white, but probably not technicolor either. A woman who now remembers two things best about you. The way you made me weep as we sailed through February gales across the Atlantic in luxury. And the photos you took of me in a studio filled with light almost crushing the barrels of guns. The way you recreated me in black and white. You never came out of the dark room to look at my coiling hair. Your camera, not you, saw beauty in my soft face, not appropriate then for the femme fatale, the tough sexy broads of noir. Finally, old Diane's face has aged in the angles of Veronica Lake, Lauren Bacall, Barbara Stanwyck. Thank God you are not the one here now to photograph. I think um, growing up without a father shaped me in both positive and negative ways. Um, in the positive sense, 
I have always idealized and romanticized men. Um, I wasn't too popular with some of the hardcore feminists of the 60s because I liked men a little bit too much. Um, the negative side is that growing up without men, and especially growing up without my father, meant that I grew up not to be a very good judge of men. And um, so consequently, my life has uh, suffered from some of my choices based on this poor judgment. I think one of the things that happened as a result of that poor judgment was that I began to make friends with many homosexual men. And, um, and maybe that was not good or bad judgment, that was just serendipity of the art world of the 60s. But the bad judgment aspect of it was that I somehow expected them to convert for me <laughs> and become interested in me as a woman. Um, clearly a foolish idea. One of the, the, the men who, whom I had that kind of fantasy and romantic idealization about was a poet named George Stanley. He had been a lover of Jack Spicer's in San Francisco. Um, and though I knew Jack Spicer in San Francisco when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, I didn't know George. But when George came to New York City where I was living, he looked me up and we became close friends. But uh, for me, um, friends with a problem, since I always kept expecting him to like me better than the men he knew. And needless to say, that didn't work out very well. This is a poem I wrote. Uh, thinking of, of George in the 60s. It's called Apparitions Are Not Singular Occurrences. And I think that whenever I began to idealize and romanticize uh, a, a world of perfect wholeness, which for me had to be um, a man and a woman, perhaps before I had discovered, not actually discovered singularity. Um, this, this was just an image of death, constantly an image of death. In my idealization, I was not Lady Godiva riding naked on a horse nor was I the virgin riding on a white horse or a unicorn. Um, in my fantasies, as you'll see in this poem, I rode a zebra, um, <laughs> black and white. Apparitions are not singular occurrences. When I rode the zebra past your door wearing nothing but my diamonds, I expected to hear bells and see your face behind the thin curtains. But instead I saw you, a bird, wearing the mask of a bird with all the curtains drawn, the lights blazing, and death drinking cocktails with you. In your thin hand like the claw of a bird because you are a bird, the drink reflected the light from my diamonds passing by. Your bird's foot like thin black threads of bone or metal staples, has the resistance necessary to keep death at a pleasant distance, drinking his scotch and enjoying your company as he seldom has a chance. The zebra hide against my bare legs is warm. The diamonds, now warm on my neck, on my fingers, my feet, my ears, how death looks at them, and my body and the old man desires them all. I rode by your windows hoping you would see me and want me, not knowing you already had a guest. The diamonds I put on for you, the clothes I took off, and my zebra. Did you see his eyes just slightly narrow as we came by? Not knowing death would be there, I rode by. And death and I see each other now so often I have even thought of becoming a trapeze artist so that I might swing on the bar away from him. So far up he'd never reach me, but instead I see him more and more with all my friends, 
drinking, talking, and always keeping his elderly eyes on me. And you, watching me ride by on my zebra, dressed only in my diamond, were my one last hope. But even you, wearing the mask of a bird, invited him to have a drink and left the curtains drawn for him, sharing something you had no right to share. Well, I don't know whether it was bad judgment about men or my terrible fear that I would be like my mother. But all my choices did go against family. And uh, I made a, a very one very, very big choice that I don't know to this day whether it's a black or a white choice. Um, but I knew, do know that these kinds of choices, bad or good, are your destiny. And um, whichever one, bad or good, that you wish to say that it is, is opposite is Frost's road not taken in your life. And it's one that you can never take once you made one choice. This next poem I, I'm going to read is a meditation that I wrote when we were in Catalonia. Uh, two years ago, my husband and I made our first trip to France. And on that trip, we drove into the Pyrenees and down into Catalonia and to the Costa of Brava. So we spent a little time in Spain there. And we were there in August. Uh, um, and we were there actually on the day of my birthday, my 66th birthday. Our, our travel companion, Wilton Barnard, uh, a wonderful novelist who loves to photograph Romanesque churches, um, was always stealing Robert off to, with him to look at Romanesque churches, and I usually begged to stay in whatever cafe there was to sit and drink and read and um, perhaps write some poems. And on that day, I stayed at this cafe called the Mulatto. And um, one of the things I began thinking about since it was my birthday was that my high school boyfriend, the, the man of the dark secrets of my life, was born the day after I was. We were almost twins. Our birthdays were virtually the same. And... Um, Yet we've had surprisingly different destinies, so I don't know what that does for astrology. But As I was sitting there uh, by this stone table outdoors, um, there was a, a girl, a teenage girl, who was constantly moving from place to place on her cell phone. Um, and she was fascinating to look at, and I began to look at all the other people there and so I started trying to figure out how these people could be part of my landscape, and this is what I came up with. At the Mulatto. In this stony garden, like a sparrow I hardly notice at first, she is hopping about to different spots. This girl, the age I was when I knew you, John. A rat tattooed on her shoulder, a red thong showing above her low-slung khaki pants. She talks endlessly on her cell phone, moving from one terrace level to another, each time a newly dialed connection. And like a chunky ghost hovering at the edge of the tavern courtyard, there is a naked boy, four years old, wheeling his red bicycle over the roughly paved area where, can it be? There is an ostrich also walking around. I am too tired to be surprised. I can't quite accept the smallness of my skull or the padded flesh of my body or that I am 66 years old today, your birthday tomorrow, John. We were almost twins. What Dionysian myth of descent and return were we trying to live as teenage lovers? It's been more than 40 years 
since our story. When you knew me, I was always the bespectacled library mouse, someone who could never have been this enchanted rat girl talking into her cell phone. So I am not sure how I bewitched myself to become the gypsy on the road poet, Medea, flying away in her chariot drawn by dragons, hair flying like long gaudy streamers, wearing a man's watch on a wide leather cuff, piercing my ears so that lovers might see me as the gypsy with a golden earring, or a woman riding naked on a zebra wearing only her diamonds, one who will always be chased by naked children, or one who sees improbable ostriches. I like the gold hoops I still often wear in my ears, and cannot forget the lines from that Marlene Dietrich film about Romany gypsies. If your love wears golden earrings, he belongs to you. What do I want to derive from this scene, this moment? To whom do I belong? Or who ever belonged to me? Earrings, but not wedding rings. The choices I still don't understand, and now that ostrich disappearing into the fenced part of the courtyard. Rain clouds. Will Robert and Wilton come back to me in time? To whom do I belong? Who returns to me? Domesticity comes so easily as one ages, sits so ill on the young. This isn't an explanation of why I couldn't marry you or why I had to give up our child for adoption. To me, but to me it explains how I can see it all so differently. Voices are Spanish, but it's Spain now, not the California where it all happened. I'm sitting across the cobbled road from a 12th century church in the Spanish Pyrenees. I'm not on the ragged screen porch in East Whittier watching the frightening male smudge pot fires undulate in the orange groves of my childhood, those fires tended by men who spoke the Latin poetry of danger to women. Yet was I ever really a gypsy singer, a troubadour, duende racking each of my impromptu California-bodied performances? What was I, a little girl afraid of Mexican gypsy men in the dark? I know I was not like the rat girl. Nor did I become the mother to the ghost child playing with an ostrich. Neither was I part of anything like the Euro couple. He with his white socked feet up on the table. She the ambiguous young brunette on a soap opera saying no. Both drinking steins of beer, their elegant black dog, half Doberman, half black lab, hunkering into the cool stone. And now, Robert comes back with a little gift a ring in the shape of a black and silver heart. Wilton says he has found at last a church he's never seen before. Even though they know I've sat here at this stone cafe table thinking about ghosts or what happened to me when I was young and acted like a gypsy, neither believes on this afternoon of my 66th birthday that I have actually seen an ostrich playing with a naked child. Um, part of my myth developed in my poems a way to think my way through the secrets and troubles in my life was <clears throat> to become Medea the sorceress who in Euripides plays murders her children because of the treacheries of Jason um this poem is called Medea the Sorceress. She is in the home for unwed mothers in Pasadena, the only girl who reads poetry. He writes to her from his prep school and she memorizes the sonnets of Shakespeare as she takes her exercise on the dusty, scrubby grounds of the home. No enchantment changes her life. She is told by the social worker that she has failed because she still loves Jay. She doesn't regret doing anything for love. 
She does not believe she is bad. She doesn't regret giving up her child. She believes her life will go on the same as it has always gone on. She won't talk about her mistakes. This is the same as being on the desert. This life in the linoleum floored room, eating with girls who have been raped by their fathers, and girls who got caught but didn't know with what man, and girls who were only 13, and girls who were nurses sleeping with doctors, and girls who wanted to forget everything and join the army, girls who were all pregnant and ashamed and who knew they were wandering some desert, though most of them, most of us, didn't know the names of desert rattlers or moths like the dusty silver wing, or about the tiny burrowing owls or the lingering scent of sagebrush when the night was pure, pure as we knew we still were. So as if she were Medea, when the letters came talking casually about his dates with other girls, unpregnant girls, she decided that she would have no choice. She would kill him and her children and like the sorceress leave for another world in her chariot drawn by dragons. She gave up her baby. No regrets. Only the weak have regrets. She went to Berkeley and she told him to go away. No regrets. Only the weak have regrets. She flew in her chariot with all her dragon lady power to Berkeley, then New York, then the Midwest, and finally to this cafe where she sits telling the tale not of the tribe, but of herself. And in spite of what others say, she knows that the song this silvery, moon-questing lady of dragon light sings is the tale for at least half of the tribe. Strum, gunslinger. Hail, Maximus. Ascent is descent, Dr. Patterson. O oh, love, one-eyed poet, where are you leading me now? No one should be at the home for unwed mothers. That's the real wasteland. These epistles, not cantos or songs, will be for Craig, Knight of Hummingbird Light, for Jonathan, who understands the myth of the woman sleeping in flame, for Steelman, my husband, who loves me at night in his invisible cap of darkness, and for all women, the other half of the tribe for Eve, who dared to eat the apple, I write this letter and sign myself, Diane, the Lady of Light. Well, that reference to the, the cap of darkness, probably some of you recognize it. Um, when Perseus has to go to slay the Gorgons, uh, he's given three magic gifts. Um, he's given Athena's sword to slay them with. He's given her shield, which will act as a mirror, because when you look at the Gorgons, especially Medusa, you turn to stone. So he needs the mirror to see cut off head. And the other thing he needs is the cap of invisibility, the cap of darkness that allows him to go in and slay Medusa. Medusa. Um, I've always felt that what most of us who are anything like artists want more than anything to be invisible. Or maybe we like fame, but what we really want is to be invisible because then we can get close enough to all the secrets to find out what's happening. And. Um, one of the things that has mm -hmm. bothered me most about aging is that I feel that people don't pay attention to me. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, Diane, finally you are wearing the cap of darkness. That all you have to do is get old and people don't pay any attention to you. You have the true enchanted secret of invisibility. So um, sometimes I feel good about aging. And this is a poem in which I try to praise that aspect. It's called Ode to My Hands, and it begins with an epigraph from my, one of my favorite Wallace Stevens poems, Peter Quince at the Clavier. And Wallace Stevens, in that poem, 
says, Beauty is momentary in the mind, the fitful tracing of a portal, but in the flesh it is immortal. One of the things I've been doing in the last few decades is practicing Tai Chi, although I call it Dai Chi because I can only do about a third of the long form. But um, the image at the end comes from a <coughs> tape about Tai Chi practice made by Terence Dunn. Ode to my hands. Sometimes I think my old hands are beautiful like Arabians nuzzled into Kentucky bluegrass, their coats with the satin of chestnuts before they are roasted. My hands, though, are spotted, more like giraffe skin, and lying across my book as if they might be newborn, awkward folds, not able to be deft with small pieces like the backs of my pearl earring studs. Babies looking up, but resting against their mother book. My handwriting gets smaller and harder to read. These spotted, translucent hands seem too plump to write a thin line. They do look like miniature hens, pale frogs, or shaky-legged colts as they rest on pages of Wallace Stevens or on my denim knees. Still, they cleave to my body, though it hardly seems to belong to me anymore. My mind curls also like the giraffe slashes, fringed petal-like and so inappropriately as if for romance, as do my old hands. In Tai Chi, you're supposed to hold out beautiful lady wrists. And as I was circling through the forum this morning, piercing into my living room windows came a shaft of light that exactly passed into my undulating hands a pen of light dipped into its own ink, and I pulled it through the air, knowing for a moment that despite my age, I still could reinvent myself, perhaps even still write this ode with the hands that have always longed to play at Peter Quince's clavier. I'm going to read four more poems. <clears throat> One of the mythic figures whom I write about is someone I call the motorcycle betrayer. Uh, Perhaps he deserves that title since um, he left me twice, not just once. The first time he left me, I wrote the poem that Dave mentioned, Dancing on the Grave of a Son of a Bitch. And then he came back, and we were together, and he left me again. And the second time, he did not come back. And I wrote a whole book of poems called The Motorcycle Betrayal Poems. Um, one of the things that happened to me a few summers ago when we were in France, when I visited the Remy Martin factory, which seemed very beautiful to me, perhaps because I used to drink uh, Remy Martin cognac as my regular drink, um, and that was when I was living with Tony Weinberger, the motorcycle betrayer, I was able to, to write a poem in which I felt that I finally exorcised all the ghosts of the motorcycle betrayer. But in fact, I don't know that we ever exercise all the ghosts that are in our lives. And uh, so here is yet another poem dedicated to the motorcycle betrayer. It's called Proust Askew, a poem using a line from John Wieners. Um, a friend sent me a, a bunch of poems using lines from John Wieners, who is one of his favorite poets. And while Wieners is a poet I admire, he's not one of my favorite poets, but I thought, oh, I'm going to reciprocate. I'm going to write a poem beginning with a line um, by John Wieners. So I began searching through Wieners' poems to find a line that really resonated with me. And in one of his poems, um, a poem called Sunset, 
I found this line. Um, Who laughs now and dances in the canyons of New York? It wasn't after, until many um, revisions of this poem that I was able to really work the dance metaphor all the way through the poem. Um, I have to confess that I've never read the whole of Remembrance as the Things Past. At best, I've read... Um, passages here and there, pages or events of it. Um, but I suppose the mark of a very great piece of literature is that somehow it seems like um, a piece of literature that you know even when you haven't read it. And, uh, or maybe that's a very Philistine thing to say. But I love the idea of remembrances of things past in the way that that gives us a sort of trope for connecting many realities in our lives. So I, I use his line, and I finally put him in the title, Proust Askew, poem using a line from John Wieners. Who laughs now and dances in the canyons of New York? That's not a question. It's an idol. As I never think of the city without thinking of you, the man from East Fifth Street, your substance, how it boundaried me, gave me gravity, even shape, crystallizing those wispy streamers of canyon fog that were all that held me together. For years, neither of us has lived there, nor even spent much time in the city. Recent memories are of dark Russian breads at Balthazar's, or the strawberries of Union Square as big as ice cream scoops, candied violets so hard to find in the Midwest, movies at the Angelica Film Forum, they contrast with remembrances of things past, walking home from Max's Kansas City, or the rustle of aqueous silk when you looked at me quoting the poetry of William Carlos Williams. Even in my imagination, we wouldn't have danced or laughed, though we felt we belonged together, the way Bob Dylan's songs belong to American blue jeans and shearling coats, our shared sense of being mavericks. So many of us, perhaps, laughing and dancing, but mainly learning to choreograph our way through the canyons of New York in the 60s to define ourselves not by gender, but the foxtrot of long hair, or the breakdance of mustaches, the tango of short skirts, the happenings of defied taboos in the en point of John Cage's mushroom walks. If I turned it into a question who laughs now and dances in the canyons of New York? Perhaps the answer would not seem as smoky, as wispy, as full as the floating ectoplasm that memory embellishes. And perhaps I would still, not still, be blaming you for rejecting me. I sometimes long for the dance lessons of my past more than the theater seats of the present but this is in the context of comfort, of Proust's Madeleines, the fragrance of the newly baked embodying the reality of those eaten so many years ago. The real residue is not nostalgia. How can we not be angry that someone other than ourselves might be slow dancing those canyons with someone we love or once loved? How not be angry about being left with only frail alternatives? Unless we hold, of course, onto the true 60s dance, the twist. We can declare ourselves reborn, that we were rewriting the story, not remembering it, thus able to laugh now and dance in the canyons of New York, even as we flinch from the subsequent canyons of Laguna Beach, that replaced them, and the frightening drives home through coastal fog, California marine air, the knowledge of the abandoned house, the little wooden box where a skeleton quietly folded himself under the AIDS quilt. That was the destiny you flung me toward when you let someone else cut in, then quick-stepped to the woods of a northern state where you still live, 
and left me dancing in my torn sailor's daughter way with another man, driving, not laughing or dancing, through canyons that could only be filled with paper ghost feet drawn on Arthur Murray walk-up floors. You, my betrayers, my fathers, my Jasons, my teachers, have mercy so that I can stop blaming you. Oh, Marcel Proust, how is it that hauntings were able to fill you with so much joy? This next poem is called um, Dancing with My Father. Actually, I find it very ironic that the man who was my high school boyfriend, who was a true klutz in high school, in his senior years has become uh, the guy at the senior center, center that all the women want to go ballroom dancing with. This poem uh, takes its epigraph from our beloved Michigan poet, Theodore Redke, from My Papa's Waltz. Redke says, the whiskey on your breath could make a small boy dizzy, but I hung on like death. Such waltzing was not easy. Dancing with my father. Between the waltz and fo foxtrot, my mother waited for a Polish sailor to poke a home from his aircraft carrier. No matter how short his leave, they would go out dancing, scattering a trail of Shalimar and Old Spice. Though if you saw my mother as I saw her, ugly-footed, heavy-hipped, German coffee body, you would not think dancer. From the dirt-floored cabin on North Dakota's immigrant plain to Southern California's salty Long Beach Pier, she drove in her rattling Ford almost as if it were a quest to find such a man as my father, his broad Slavic face made for joyful noise. And during the war, when there was a reason for his silence, his absence, she found an image that anchored her dancing romance to my father, Gene Kelly and Frank Sinatra, 1945, Anchors Away. Catherine Graceman, with the voice of a diva, wearing one of the ugliest dresses ever seen in a film, sheer white with applique sunflowers, and of course squirty 10-year-old Dean Stockwell setting a fashion for every little boy to wear a sailor suit and white hat. And for film history, there was that dancing mouse. This movie still looks good and sounds even better despite my new millennium ears. One of the many Technicolor movies my mother took us to see. For heroes, I'd probably prefer Gene Kelly as D'Artagnan or Howard Keel as a riverboat captain. Captain, But here, for my mother, were two dancing sailors. My daddy multiplied, and the one she loved was the true dancer. As a kid, I should have gone strictly for the cartoon mouse, but for me it was only a distraction. Like my mother, I watched with longing the man whose cheek was smooth as a sword blade, whose feet as neat as pinstripes, and who could charm any woman but only wanted one. The one loved by the sailor who danced and gave me everything. This sailor's daughter lives now in a landlocked house in front of which each summer, their heads tapping low to my husband's garden rhythms, stands a chorus line of gigantic sunflowers. My husband comes home every night as my father never did. And as the poet says, that dancing is not easy. My husband and I, I suppose, are both aestheticians of a sort, <laughs> um, but very differently so. This poem is called Trying to Convince Robert That a Woman Whom He Doesn't Like Is Beautiful. And... Um, I guess this is another goddess poem. I admit, I didn't think this woman, shiny as a blackbird, this tidy ant, was much either. And her ferocious beaking of politically incorrect snobs like, like me, who disdain people who don't want to read books, 
wasn't calculated to make her like me either. I thought maybe we'd be two chattering magpies with long white tails balancing us on the electric phone lines, clicking and clack chattering our King of Spain fantasies in this Midwestern town. But she ruffled her feathers the minute I was honest, told her what I felt. So I, too, wasn't looking for any beauty. I, too, wasn't even expecting a harmonious image ever again. She shooed me away out of her backyard quickly after one conversation. Still, I did occasionally see her in the halls of the building where we both worked. What I am telling you is that when I mentioned to Robert that I thought she was beautiful, and he just frowned and implied I had bad taste, I realized that like a crow, she would seldom be noticed beyond her raucous condemnations of us all. Yet I was also thinking of seeing her that week standing as small as a pony would be to a racehorse, as small as a black cat, as small as a blackbird seems next to a crow, seeing her with white stockings flashing against her black skirt, her black hair pulled into a bun, and just the plink of those white stockings sheer against her pink, neat as an office girl leg, black shoes as Sunday school, black and white so neatly tied, a package of such stylish simplicity, the way Bonwit teller women pretend they're still students at Miss Porter's. I knew then that the secret to this woman was that she'd transform her earthly image into what people expected of her. And the wrong turning when we met was how inaccurately she had assessed what I was, thus what I might expect of her. How she misjudged me. And thus, how unlikely I might see her true image. What an accident when I saw her one day that she didn't know I was looking. I realize that I seldom see anyone with a simple turn of leg who can wear sheer white stockings. But that day showed my own misjudgment. If Robert had seen her legs against the shiny black of her silhouette that day, he'd understand a harsh image in black and white. And here she'd been pretending all along that she had to be photographed in color. I found her beauty, but even Robert the photographer didn't comprehend fully. Though she didn't care, she didn't trust us, or want her eyes, our eyes on her, us, excuse me, or want our eyes on her at all. In taking her picture, we would still her voice. And finally, unlike me, she didn't care for silent beauty. As you might guess, this is a very verbal feminist came to our department and decided I wasn't correct enough in my points of view. Uh, this last poem is a totem poem rather than a goddess poem. Um, I was sicker than I've ever been this fall uh, with a ruptured appendix and uh, the good thing is this. So I'll begin with my chant of noir before the night had a thousand eyes, I began a life scarred with pin-pricking light, with scarab blue always tinged black, fearing water's beetle glitter, water's father loss, a sailor's daughter without a silver compass, charting a course, navigating the movie screen. I have looked for sailors all my life, trying to find my father. Like a paper with a bent corner, haphazardly stuffed in an accordion file, I was lying at midnight in a hospital room. It was cold enough to keep a yellow rose in a styrofoam cup fresh for ten days without new water. There was only a film between waking or sleeping, nothing opaque. Eyes open or closed absorbed the same images. Thus, whether it was a waking sight or one from sleep is only surmise, but with quick solidity it was there, standing oblique to the corner of my bed, tall as a man's shoulder and motionless, his eyes looking straight ahead rather than at me. 
I myself was shivering, as I often did there at night, but seeing this presence, I forgot my discomfort and murmured, as those who are ill speak without sound. The blue ice wolf. His coat, as Stephen says of junipers, was shagged with ice. Even though friends have told me that my apparition was benevolent, that wolves are protectors, companions, kindly escorts, some part of me thought I saw one of death's messengers. It felt Egyptian to me, yet neither a jackal nor Anubis of the desert. No, the ice was there like the chips of it that were my only sustenance that week, shaping or glinting his coat until it was crusted and bejeweled. The blue ice wolf was there to accompany me as I trod underground paths. Now, when I peek out from that place I was a few weeks ago, I see his shadow, still alert, watching, not me, but everything that comes near, listening, I think, to my papery breath that moves and rustles even in recovery. He is watching over me as if he is a father.